Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. Uh, we hope that uh, you're doing well. Uh, remember, as I always say, this is your program, and we've had a lot of calls uh, and uh, notes from the viewers uh, relative to uh, some mental health and substance abuse issues. And uh, knowing that we have experts in our community, uh, I asked uh, Dr. Mendriata if he would be willing to come forward and uh, talk about some personalized care of uh, mental health problems and substance abuse. So welcome, Dr. Mendriata, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Lippman. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I know we had a, a number of acronyms after your name, so you want to just tell us the subspecialties or the, uh, the areas that you are certified in? Yeah, so I am a, a board-certified adult psychiatrist, also do a lot of uh, addiction medicine work, and I also do, uh, like yourself in the past, a lot of uh, education. I'm a residency a training director of, of Broward Health Psychiatry Program and also the chief medical officer for my psychiatrist. Good. Well, I, I, I know you always hear uh, wonderful uh, uh, comments back from the, uh, the rotating students and otherwise that uh, go through uh, your area at the Broward Health and we thank you very much. As a primer to our discussion, uh, why don't you just tell us uh, how uh, broad and where your services are available? Yes, sir. So, um, so the entity I'm a part of as, uh, you know, one of the chief medical officers is uh, mypsychiatrist.com. Uh, and basically, we are an entity, a group practice. We've been around for about uh, over 10 years now, so time flies. And basically, the services that we offer is, uh, you know, a plethora of uh, services for mental health uh, wellness, mental health awareness, such as seeing psychiatrists, uh, the ability to see therapists, and even providing cutting-edge uh, technology for treatment of refractory mental health conditions such as depression, which would be a transcranial magnetic stimulation, having that treatment modality as well. And we're spread all throughout Florida and with a focus in South Florida, having four offices uh, in Palm Beach County in Boca, and then uh, two in Broward County in uh, uh, Hollywood and Oakland Park and then recently opened an office in South Miami. So within those facilities, multiple you know, providers from various backgrounds that very much you know, blends with the diversity of South Florida to provide the best, uh, best patient care we can, Dr. Lipman. The one thing that the pandemic has done, this COVID pandemic, is that people have begun to open up their eyes to the fact that, you know, illness per se is not based upon whether you're uh, old or young in most cases. When I say old or young, I'm not talking about under 10 years old. I'm talking about teenagers, etc. Uh, and also we have situations where we have a, a really a worldwide pandemic on substance abuse. So you put the substance abuse issue together with the, the pandemic which we had relative to COVID and its variants, and you have many of the sequelae which are now coming out that people don't understand what has happened. Why do I have a, I, I, one of our questions, why do I have this shadowy head uh, is it from the COVID, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm throwing a lot of things at you, but uh, the reason I am is because the folks that, are, that ask these questions really are almost, they're very close to being desperate in trying to get an answer. So it's all yours. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, that's very, you know, true that the pandemic has, you know, 
you can look at it in kind of a bad way that, hey, you know, mental health, I think, uh, you know, exacerbations of illness has been out there due to the sequelae of the pandemic, whether that's psychosocial stressors, whether that's, of course, financial stressors. And remember, a lot of people, you know, being stuck at home for lack of better terms earlier in the pandemic, especially a lot of, you know, uh, relationship issues, marital discord, so on and so forth. So I think that was the negative side of the pandemic, but as a positive, as a me mental health care, not just provider, but as an advocate, I think it has slowly but surely with mental health stigmatization, kind of seen things go in the right direction where people are willing to kind of seek out help. People, you know, and as we know how much talk there has been about self-care, self-wellness that's on social media, that's on TV, things that, you know, topics that may not have been broached before where unfortunately in mental health, that stigma has been there where it's, you know, hey, just tough it out, just get through it, just get over it, whether it's mental health, or substances. So that's why, you know, with the pandemic, at least, you know, I can say within the confines of our practice, we have seen people who, you know, basically are saying, look, you know, I never thought I would have to see a psychiatrist or a therapist for whatever issue I'm having. But, you know, people, you know, having that fortitude, and maybe having that empowerment, due to that stigmatization getting better. So I think the pandemic has been, you know, a mixed blessing in disguise for mental health awareness, Dr. Lippman. And that's something that at least, you know, slowly but surely, as you talked about, you know, with the, the asylums and things, you know, unfortunately, inpatient psychiatric facilities, the paradigm, as you are aware, has very much shifted from long term facilities to very short term, a couple days stabilization. So that's why us as a practice, we really want to make sure to serve the community of Florida, South Florida specifically, and have those gaps filled where outpatient follow up, the ability to see a therapist, the ability to see a psychiatrist. And one more thing, Dr. Littman, as you're um, aware, is that telemedicine has also been a blessing for a lot of folks during the pandemic where people can feel comfortable to see a psychiatrist such as myself, see a therapist, whereas you know other specialties like cardiology, that might be different where the, where the um, consumer does need to come in the office and you know get certain labs drawn, get a physical exam done. So luckily in our space, of course, seeing a person to build that therapeutic connection is of utmost importance, but at least offering that service has also made people you know, less reluctant or less stigmatized to actually seek out help. Well, you know, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, we had uh, one of uh, really the, uh, the nation's premier uh, child psychologists. Uh, we just did a program a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about uh, the, the, the impact uh, on younger people. And we spoke about the, the issue came up about suicides and how uh, the, the numbers have increased so dramatically between age 9 through 17. It was, it, it really, it was astonishing to me. Uh, I, I always knew that it was, it was there, but uh, I, I, I wonder what, I would assume that uh, the issues that are prevalent within that area of age is also presented to you in your, uh, to your, yourself and your colleagues in the practices that you provide. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, so we uh, do have a few board certified uh, child and adolescent psychiatrists, and that has been a challenge, you know, COVID pandemic or not, especially the trends we see as, you know, I, I saw in your last program with your uh, colleague uh, psychologist, where, you know, that trend has definitely been going in a very concerning, alarming, sharp rise. And, you know, besides outside of the confines and stressors of a pandemic for any young human being, for lack of better terms, I think, unfortunately, what we're dealing with is also that social media presence where now more than ever, unfortunately, we have kids, you know, when I say well under the age of 10 sometimes who are 
going on social media, have social media accounts, have social media access. And of course, you know, I'm tempering my words with this, but it's very frustrating for me as a mental health advocate and mental health provider to see TV shows that are the most popular TV shows in the country that even in the past, a few years ago, glorify, you know, suicidality and even suicide in these young populations. And these are some of the most popular shows that actually carry disclaimers. But as we know, kids these days with technology, it's very different than when I was growing up where you can simply put a lock or demon have cable TV to now, you know, that information is or that programming is going to be available, even if parents do their best to try to prevent it. Yeah. Uh, Let's uh, talk a bit about, uh, and I'm, I want to get back to this this thing with, with children because it's, it's there so many questions have come to us, but I want to get into the area of substance abuse. Sure. So, you know, obviously, as we talked about, it's all around the country, but I think South Florida, I've been practicing down years, um, down here in South Florida for 10 years plus, and what we call that uh, dual diagnosis where a substance use disorder is very usually a very high percentage comorbid with an actual mental health disorder. So that's where also, um, you know, luckily that awareness is out there that substance use, just like some mental health issues, unfortunately, is still kind of looked at as a character defect. So that stigma is there that, hey, this person just doesn't know how to cope and uh, person X, Y, and Z is you know, just, you know, creating so much strain for their family, uh, legal issues, so on and so forth. And that's where, you know, the paradigm is also shifted for substance treatment to really not just simply, you know, as, as you know, detoxify someone safely off of substances where that used to be the substance treatment model and then send them out to NA and AA, which I think is, you know, one of the best layers of solidarity and support for long-term recovery But before getting to that point, it's a paramount importance to actually address why is the substance use uh, disorder there? Um, You know, for most folks, it's actually going to be self-medicating and it's going to be a comorbid underlying mental health disorder that that sobriety time is going to show that there is something there for which they are using substances for. And also with advances in mental health and addiction, luckily we're seeing Dr. Lippman, uh, you know, actual studies, genetic studies, chromosome studies, as we know, just like heart disease, just like, uh, you know, so many other types of uh, malignancies, cancer, uh, where there is that family uh, genetic traits, uh, a predisposition, I should say, we're also seeing that in substance. So luckily the paradigm in this area has slowly been shifting of really looking at not just safely detoxify, but look at these other factors that are implicated in substance abuse and ensuring you know, ideal treatment outcomes on top of that. Well, and again, I would assume that, and you could talk to this, the, the, the nexus between uh, the, the intake of a, a drug that's being abused and the psychological, uh, in, uh, I guess you could say, tendency to want to get to that drug. Uh, can we talk about that for a bit? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, definitely for our viewers, I know me and you can uh, chop shop pharmacologically how things and brain receptors. But, you know, basically it's very simple that, you know, someone who is abusing a certain substance of choice it's going to get to the point where tolerance builds up. So it's going to take more and more of that substance to produce both twofold, a physical effect, but also a neurochemical effect. And usually, as uh, you're well aware, things, uh, Dr. Lippmann, like dopamine getting affected and eventually these uh, receptors getting saturated to the point that you need excessive amounts of substances to quote unquote, catch that high to quote unquote, catch that feeling. And that's where we see all these unfortunate things we see in the news, like fatal overdoses. And as we know, it's very different, the market out there with synthetic, uh, you know, opiates, uh, for example, the fentanyl, norfentanyl, all these different, you know, types of, uh, you know, chemicals out there. And before you know it, someone who is used to getting a certain batch of opiates is using, you know, that same dose and, you know, unfortunately passing. So that's what we see every day, even in the emergency rooms I work out of. 
let me get back to uh, the children, if you don't mind. Uh, we, we've had uh, a lot of uh, parents that uh, probably, uh, they, they in, in a way, they're correct in the fact that we, we, we did not have students in classrooms for a long period of time. There were so many of these young people uh, need the socialization. They need the, the companionship, the willingness to communicate with their friends and sometimes their non-friends. Uh, do you see a lot of, uh, in that area, do you see even parents uh, falling apart on the issue of, of seeing their own child uh, changing to what they consider the word that one of the viewers said to the worse. Do you see much of that? Yeah, yeah. And you stole it out of my mouth, Dr. Lipman, that a lot of times, uh, you know, you know, me personally, as, uh, you know, primarily an adult psychiatrist, uh, see parents frustration coming in, because, you know, as we know, that, you know, that collegial kind of uh, camaraderie building happens, even as toddlers, you know, when you see groups of, you know, young children, you know, getting together, interacting, even though, you know, they can barely even talk. But that's where that human bond is so important. So then as you get up in school to preschool, even those early kindergarten, first uh, grade, you know, human development, brain development, social development, you know, those things with the pandemic, definitely, you know, those precious years disappeared, you know, in terms of that exposure. So a lot of times we do see, we have seen some parents where a lot of times, you know, they're having issues where it's affecting, as I said, relationship with, you know, their spouse in terms of, you know, um, you know, issues with their children, but also all the way to adolescence where adolescents, you know, of course, uh, you know, having that natural, sometimes rebellious streak, wanting to quote unquote, explore the world, being able to engage in their sports activities, extracurricular activities at school, engaging with, uh, you know, um, engaging with other classmates and exploring, you know, even the uh, themes going along with puberty, so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, the pandemic stifled a lot of those things where now, uh, just as you said, you know, acting out is something I've heard from a handful of parents where kids, adolescents, you know, acting out and where they have such an issue reconciling this. And then also on the flip side, they're also at home due to their job limitations from the pandemic where now they might be working from home with their spouse on top of that. So unfortunately, it can be a very, you know, tough uh, spiral down where it's one thing on top of another. So me personally, I have seen it very, uh, you know, directly, but also indirectly with parents who are affected by these issues where the kids are not able to have that, you know, outlet and that proper learning environment and for their social, you know, development. That has been an issue, absolutely. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, uh, the viewing audience who sends us these questions, and the reason why we're happy we wanted to have this program is because there seems to be a lot of the misunderstanding and yet deep empathy for the children. I mean, it, they're not, they're not, they're not complaining. Some, although some people do complain by their by their written text about, well, my, my, my kid's not getting their schooling and then they're, they're, they're going to be kept behind for another year or things like You know, I understand that. At least I understand it. But what I'm saying is that the, the impact on their socialization, their capability to communicate with other young people and, and then relate that type of personality, whatever it is, a change, flaw, or otherwise, and they bring it back home, uh, it, it, it affects the adult who then comes to you and says, I don't know what I did. Well, what, what, what did I do to have my kid tell me that I'm rotten? Uh, or, you, know, you know what I'm saying? That's a good word. Uh, I, I, yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, well, I can't use other words. So, but re really, uh, you know, it, it, it's really, to me, it's, it's, we're in, but we're in a great point in time where we're transforming 
our whole healthcare system to a new methodology through technology, through uh, the, the type of work that we're doing right now. I mean, here we are, you're not in the studio, I'm in the studio and you're in your office, and yet we're having this conversation. Uh, I, I feel very secure in having the conversation with you, uh, not only because you're a, a good guy and also a wonderful physician, but the, real, the reality is, is that there are a lot of people that don't have that capability. You know, they, they have to go to work. Uh, we still have latchkey children, you know. Uh, wh where, where, what happens? And that's these questions that are coming to us. And I'm just wondering uh, how it affects the adults that you're involved with. Uh, you've already spoken to it, but it, it really is, uh, it, it's, it's very puzzling to me. Yeah, you know, it, it, it really is. And luckily, like I touched on a little bit earlier in the program, Dr. Lippman, that's where, you know, having hopefully those stigmas slowly but surely lift that, hey, I don't necessarily need to see a psychiatrist and need to be on psychotropic medications, but at least that's something our practice has really built up our therapy arm where a therapist is available and a therapist you know, unfortunately, even 10 years ago when I was in, you know, a wrap over 10 years ago, when I wrapped up a residency and things where even therapy, getting a therapist was like, oh, that's only those Hollywood types. That's only, you know, you know, that type of kind of, uh, you know, where it's like a spa type treatment. And the way I look at it now, and a lot of people look at it, that it's just like going to the gym. It's just like, you know, going, seeing, you know, grandma, making sure she's okay, you know, across town, whatever wellness activity, part of your routine, seeing a therapist, uh, luckily just in those past 10 years, I've seen that paradigm shift where it is acceptive. And, and, and the key is it's not as exclusive as it might've been looked at. Most healthcare plans uh, uh, cover that service. So that's where you, uh, you better believe Dr. Lippman, most of my folks, that I'm seeing for me for medication issues and, and looking at psychotropic medications as a psychiatrist, you better believe the first thing I tell them is, hey, what I'm doing is as important, if not much less important than you seeing a therapist. And if you're not seeing a therapist, us working together is not even gonna make sense with medication. So that tells you as an MD psychiatrist, how much the paradigm has really shifted. And really, again, to underscore uh, to the folks, uh, you know, psychiatric care, psychologic care is not just writing a prescription and that's it. You know, it's not like this is the antibiotic that's going to take care of it. No, 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 no. No, it's the communication. It's the communication with the, the spirit and the education and the experience of people such as yourself and your colleagues. That's really what does it. Am I correct? Absolutely. And I think that's what makes a field of psychiatry unique, um, where, you know, we, all of us clinicians get to use ourselves as a diagnostic tool to build that rapport with folks. And that's why, you know, I love what I do and, you know, knock on wood, it's, you know, it's going to stay that way. But at the same time, I think that's important where us in the mental health field, you know, those results may not come as quick as, you know, hey, the uh, your primary care doctor prescribing a Zithromax pack for your upper respiratory infection. You're fine in five days and you see your primary care doctor next year for your regular labs, you know, that's where we have to use ourselves as a diagnostic tool to build that report, show that empathy. And with those results, you know, even though we might have a lot of peaks and valleys until we get to that peak of a great result, that's what makes, you know, our field so fulfilling. And I'm very lucky to be in this field. Well, we're down to the last minute and a half of this show. And I want to thank you very, very much because, you know, uh, Yes, you're a highly skilled uh, psychiatrist, but to me, you are also a highly skilled advocate for good care. And today, I believe one of the values, if there is any value to an illness, that mental health is part of health care. It's for everyone. And uh, I, I, I thank you for being such a loyal advocate for the good care uh, of individuals, not only relative to mental health, 
but also to the uh, the communication that invol is involved with substance abuse. So thank you and your colleagues. We appreciate it. And once again, uh, what's the name of the, uh, the, the medical service? Yes, it's uh, uh, mypsychiatrist.com. Uh, and uh, simple, you know, just go to, you know, the internet, mypsychiatrist.com. And, uh, you know, anything we can do for the community, we are here for Florida, but specifically that focus in South Florida. So lots of different services, Dr. Lippman, as I mentioned, from, you know, psychiatrists to therapists to even, as I said, cutting edge technology outside of medications that can really help folks struggling with mental illness. And just like you said, very poignant and perfect the way you said, mental health is not just out there. As people, we can all better ourselves. So that's what I think makes our field unique and slowly but surely going in that way where people can recognize that. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, uh, you ought to be blessed and uh, I wish you well. And uh, anytime that we at Nova Southeast University can be of help to you, just let us know. Uh, folks, uh, I, I think we, uh, we answered most of the questions that came our way. Remember, I always tell you, uh, you have to communicate with your health care provider. Uh, just think uh, uh, about trying to take care of yourself and uh, self-diagnose yourself with, with mental health. It doesn't work. Uh, you got to get to the physicians. You got to get the, them to be able to get to people like uh, Dr. Menderada. Uh, and we have to make sure that, uh, that you take care of yourself. Remember, this program is called Dateline Health. And we come to you from Nova Southeastern University. If you have any questions or answers you want, uh, we'll try to get them to the doctor. And here we have it right here. That is the address. Remember, take good care of yourself. My name is Fred Lippman. This show is called Dateline Health. Till next time, see ya.